Welcome everyone to our uh, May Spinning Yarn Speaker Series. My name is Matthew Rowe and I'm the CEO of the Campaign for Wool in Canada and its parent organization, the Canadian Wool Council. Um, the Campaign for Wool was established in Canada by our patron, His Majesty King Charles III, and was launched by Their Majesties the King and Queen on a windy pier in Picto, Nova Scotia uh, back in 2014. Uh, ever since then, we've been sort of focused on on two primary areas one is to promote the the wonders of wool in general and the other is to develop specifically opportunities for canadian wool and the canadians who transform it uh, a big part of that effort which has formed a lot of our work over the past few years is gar guided by our wool plan and i'm pleased to see we've got um, our, our co-author Jane Underhill here, uh, who can answer questions when it comes to uh, strategy. Um, but the, the wool plan was all about tackling some of the systemic barriers that we face uh, in the wool industry and includes rebranding and revaluing Canadian wool, um, connecting all aspects of the Canadian wool value chain and promoting um, Canadian wool internationally and building links with the international community. On that note, um, some, many of you may have received our recent newsletter, uh, which contains updates on some of our, our recent plans released, like the sharing plan, the upcoming upholstery plan. Um, we also had a Canadian delegation at the recent meeting of the International Wool Textile Organization, which was in um, Kyoto, Japan. And again, was the first opportunity that we had to really attend the larger of the two meetings that the IWTO um, does each year. And so, um, you know, if you're ever feeling down about the future of wool, uh, just go to one of these meetings and you really see the incredible array of talent, technology and resources that countries around the world are investing in wool uh, and and all aspects of it, again, in terms of um, high end um, merino for clothing, uh, as well as strong wool for interiors. Um, and so again, that is work that we continue to drive forward because we see a big opportunity. A lot of the work that we've done in the last few years has been identifying and quantifying the opportunities available for Canadian strong wool, um, particularly in the interior sector. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to read that message, I suggest you do. There's lots of great uh, tidbits in there as well as links um, to uh, to some of our work, including we were able, for those of you who've um, seen our Fabric of Canada video series, uh, that formed part of my official presentation there. And again, was a great way of being able to showcase, we showed the, the British Columbia film about Coast Salish weaving. And it was a really, because again, it was a story that even with these people who've been involved in the wool industry, in some cases for generations, uh, had no sense of that, uh, that history and that deep Indigenous connection with wool uh, that we have here in Canada. So it was a great way of, of sort of checking off a couple boxes in terms of uh, branding our fiber and telling our stories to the world. Um, but we're here for our Spinning Yarn Speaker Series, uh, not just for a general update on the campaign for wool, uh, but to learn more about the, the incredible people who are um, changing the wool world every day in Canada. The Spinning Yarn Speaker Series was created by request by you uh, to, be, to provide an opportunity to a, chat more about the work of the campaign, but also, again, to dive deep into um, individuals working throughout the value chain and, and learning, um, you know, what they're doing uh, to advance the wool industry in this country. Uh, and so we're very lucky to have with us here today, uh, Romy Show. Romy is a, a longtime partner of the Campaign for Wool. Um, and in addition to running a wool company, a Revolution Wool Company, she also controls the supply. So her and her husband, Ryan, uh, run run a farm. And that is not a fake backdrop. Uh, those are her sheep right there uh and uh so she's joining us from from the barn uh and she's going to talk to us about her her work in in sheep in wool, building a wool company uh and uh and creating value-added products with canadian wool so it's uh straight from the sheep's mouth uh i'm happy to hand it over to you romy romy thanks so much matthew uh thanks for having me hopefully you guys okay um, but yeah, coming from you from the barn, uh, or I guess special guest, and yeah, so you'll see stuff going on behind me, some buying. Uh, this group right here is a really big group that just lambed in May, and there's someone there uh, buying, trying to find mom, or mom trying to find lambs. So uh, 
uh, there's always a little bit of noise, but um, if you need me to, I can move into the other room if it's too much uh, background noise. Let's see, you want to share presentation? I started on that. All right, so that is us. Um, yeah, it all started. So that's the family farm here, my husband, Ryan and I, and our kiddos. And yeah, the reason we have Revolution Bull Company of Circle R. Uh, next. So this is where it started. Uh, we took over the farm that Ram Ryan's grandparents uh, were managing and also like to acknowledge the Indigenous and First Nations people uh, that were the original caretakers of this land. And I hope we can take, uh, you know, do justice and take really good care of the land and provide for our family and for our community and foster those connections, not only in agriculture and agriculture, but also with uh, the First Nations. Uh, so yeah. Those, <laughs> that, that, that's all the original barns. Um, we started with 25 sheep and it was a bit of an experiment. This farm used to have pigs, cattle and chickens on it. I grew up on a dairy farm, so we had a very different uh, farming background. Our first generation sheep farmers, we started with 25 and the joke was that one day we'd have a thousand. And as you can see behind me, we're there. Uh, so yeah, that was one of our one of our big goals. And when we started with those 25, it was, you know, we enjoyed working with them. We saw a lot of potential as far as uh, selling the clams and everything like that. And it was sheep are a great way to start into agriculture and then build up from there. So we did huge investments. Um, but yeah, if you want to switch to the next slide. We spent about 15 years juggling three babies off farm jobs for the two of us blood, sweat, and tears of renovating those barns because nothing had been done to them uh, since about the 70s. So kind of had this opportunity because we needed to renovate the barns and sort of start telling our own story, we could do what we wanted. So that was our start in sheep. Next. So this was the big jump in 2018. We decided to expand. We had kind of grown from the 25 views. We kind of expanded to 100 and then to 400. And then this was our big jump. So we built the new barn. That's where I'm sitting today. And in 2019, Ryan quit his off farm job and both of us have been home full time. Since. So yeah, it's a, Lots of big changes, and yeah, it took us a lot of years to work to that. And yeah, we've been here 15 years now, so living the dream. Um, yeah, next. So a little bit about our sheep. We started off with just some crossbreds to try it out, and then we moved on to um, purebred Dorsets. And from purebred Dorsets, we've added in does, uh, a prolific crossbred mix. There's some tunis. Um, a few different breeds, but our focus is on producing quality meat lambs um, to sell either auction or to local abattoirs. And then we also sell breeding. So we sell breeding rams and breeding lambs as well. Um, and then our goal is not only just in producing quality meat lambs, we want to ensure productive maternal um mothers um, use that can lamb themselves that don't need any help that produce a lot of milk that lays raise those lambs good one of the things we like to say is you know if you can't have lambs by yourself and have them lift off and nursing we kind of don't want you um you need to be efficient on the farm here uh, especially with how many sheep we have we can't spend time babying them and i think that's really important just for the industry in general we need easy care animals because Overall, for business and just for your your physical and mental health as a human and as a farmer, um, they need to be able to do these jobs themselves. Uh, next. So yeah, here's an example of some of our meat. So on the left is one of our market lambs just hung up at the abattoir. Um, some cuts of meat and the fresh product. And yeah, this lamb meat was one of those big uh, potentials that we saw, and there's still huge potential for lamb in Canada and in Ontario. Uh, we have a diverse population that, you know, everywhere else in the world, lamb and goat are uh, number one on the protein list. 
And even in North America, a lot of people are, you know, they're starting to have those diverse palettes as well. Um, you know, they're trying lamb and incorporating it into their sort of, you know, weekly, weekly diets. So lots of potential there and that's still growing. Uh, next. So I'll just talk a little bit about our farm management. We have kind of um, a unique spot here. We have some really highly productive and valuable land. And in that, um, we manage our flock on an accelerated system. And the accelerated system is where the sheep are lambing more than once a year. And one of the reasons we picked the Dorset breed and some of the other crosses and Rio is that these sheep are ovulating year round. They can get pregnant all year and we manage the flock that way. So the flock is split up into about four to five groups and we have lambs born every other month. So there are six lambing groups a year. Each you will lamb three times in two years. And because we can do that with those sheep, we are also pushing a lot of quality forage production. So we are uh, doing haylage, corn silage. So those are the whole, uh, feed crop chopped up and stored in a silo so it's fermented kind of like pickles and then we balance specific rations for each of the groups based on their production so like the mamas behind me here that are lactating they're feeding their lambs they get extra protein and energy and minerals because they're producing a lot more versus these ones over here this is just a breeding group the rams just went in they have a lower requirement for their nutrients so um, we use those stored feeds, work with it year round for those different groups um, and gives us that ability um, to have these use produce uh, lambs three times in two years. Um, next. Um, oh, I'll also add uh, just in our area, we also have a lot of custom um, equipment operators. So we can actually just work with some of our neighbors to do some of the forage harvesting um, and that field work and that gives us more time with the sheep. So because we've got so many sheep, we're managing all that. It's been a really great mix that we can just you know, call the neighbor and say, hey, the, the feed is ready, come and harvest it and put it in the silo. And we still have that time um, to look after the sheep. Uh, next. So just a couple uh, management jobs here, um, shearing. Um, so that is happening about five to six times a year. So the sheep get sheared before uh, they give birth to their lambs. So it just keeps them nice and clean and comfortable uh, for, for lambing. The lambs are easier to find the teeth. There's no dirty wool um, in the way. We shear all year, um, even in the winter, actually it's really nice to have them sheared because in this barn here, um, it's all insulated and everything. So it doesn't actually get too cold, but because the sheep are sheared, they give off more body heat. They're not as insulated, actually keeps the barn warmer for winter. Uh, there's one of my little kiddos helping with lambs, and the other one is, um, that's me in the handling system. So that handling system, you know, we're weighing lambs, sorting, vaccinating, trimming, ultrasounding, all of those jobs. So those also, because we have those six lambing groups a year, we're also doing all those management jobs uh, times a year basically. Um, next. Yeah, just a couple other shots, some baby lambs. Um, we also weigh everything. So that starts at birth. So that little lamb there is on a little hook thing where I'm taking his measurements. They also get their ear tag at that point and I record all their information into a software program. So, you know, we'll write down if mama had lots of milk, her udder score. So, you know, if she has a really bad udder, that's not feeding lambs. Uh, she gets a lower score versus if she has a really nice udder that's good for feeding lambs, she gets a score of five. Um, I'll also write down if there was any difficulties during birthing and that kind of stuff. So those numbers then all flow through our software program to give us genetic evaluations, which when we are picking our breeding stock, we want to pick the crop and keep picking the best ones back um, to keep uh, growing the flock and improving our flock. Next, a couple more jobs. So because we're managing a pretty... Um, intensive system and some of these prolific crosses, we will get ewes that have quads and quintuplets. Average for the Dorsets is about 1.8 to two lambs born. For the more prolific mixes, we might get 2.1 to 2.6 lambs born. 
So that adds in some other management jobs. You know, we're making uh, if a mom has three or four lambs, we're making sure that they're getting colostrum. It could be a lot of little legs and heads trying to get there to get colostrum from two teats. So we are making sure that they're just getting that really good start. If a mom does have multiples, we leave a set of twins on mama. We take the other ones and they get um, fed on a milk replacer, so like baby formula. And that machine um, sort of spits out the required amount for like it sits in the blender, has little tubes and nipples, and those lambs can then have free choice to that milk. And that's been a really good way for us to manage these extra lambs and the reason we're not leaving them with mama is because it's a lot of work for mama to feed that many lambs um some of them would be able to feed more than two lambs but it does take a lot of out of them and because on our intensive accelerated system the the lambs are with the mums for two months then they get weaned and then there's about a month break and then they get bred back um so the rams go in again so they don't have that much time um, to gain back any body condition if they happen to lose lots while they are nursing extra lambs. Um, at the top there, there's a picture of Ryan with a teaser ram. A teaser ram is a vasectomized ram. So uh, he's still got his testicles, still got all those hormones going, but nothing is coming out. So those have those teaser rams have been really important for us. It helps. They go in two weeks before the real rams go in and they help the use um, cycle. It helps them sort of get excited and gets everything going again. And that's really helped us not just with improving our conception, but especially when we're breeding sort of typical out of season. And a little shot of an ultrasound picture. We ultrasound everyone. Um, to determine whether they're pregnant or not and helps them to, helps us manage those groups. So if they're not pregnant, um, they usually get one more chance. So they just kind of flow into the next uh, reading. Okay, next, or should I, that's a lot of sheep information. Is there any questions? Feel free to type them in the chat. I can see those two on my phone. Oh, yes, there's a hand up. Judith? Hi, Romy. Nice to see you. Um, so do you breed the same ewes? Uh, how many times a year do you breed the same ewe? One and a half times. Okay. So each ewe has about an eight to ten month cycle. So if you consider she's pregnant for five months, she has baby lambs with her for about two months, and then she is dry or waiting to be bred again for a month. So usually eight to ten months. And how often can the same you be uh, bred? Typically, we're finding our ewes, they get to be about five or six years old before they sort of hit a plateau. Our main um, calling in here is their udders. So their udders sort of lose their structure. They either start hanging really low or not producing enough milk. And, and then they have to leave. And then those call use, they actually go to the meat market as well um, for mutton. So mm -hmm. they kind of do their Thank job you. and then they have one last job to do. <laughs> Thank you, Romy. Right. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess the start of the wolf story. So um, as I said, our production here on the farm is solely focused on meat production. There's no consideration as far as genetics of wool or anything like that. And for us, it kind of has to be that way. It is the meat lambs that are paying the mortgage. Um, the ewes still need to be able to produce fast growing lambs, regardless of what kind of quality their wool is. And when I say that, you know, there's nothing wrong with the quality of the wool the way it is. So um, we haven't really found a need to change that. It's been really great for what we've done. Um, yeah, the initial thought was, you know, I grew up, my mom taught me how to knit, so I had a little bit of experience that way, but make wool, wool makes yarn, yarn makes sweaters. Why can't we do that with our wool? So just at the bottom there, there's a little batch sort of, I had done um, just a small batch at one of our local mills, just to kind of see what we would get. I got involved in fiber shed um, and then just started growing the business. Um, just started doing some small batches of yarn. 
uh, doing the research, networking, that kind of thing to figure out what we could do. And yeah, that was that was about 10 years ago, I think, when our middle son was a baby. I think some of that started. And yeah, it was just slowly experimenting and slowly growing. And in about 2019, um, just before COVID, like the first year of COVID, I was gonna, I'm going to go to all the yarn shows. I'm going to do this. And then COVID hit. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of been say four years since I've really been um, working on the wool side of the business. And I'm sharing all of this, these like past number of years, I've really been trying to share a story on social media. So Circle Our Lambs, like the main farm account. And then I also added Revolution Wool Codes just to highlight the actual wool products themselves. And that's been a really great way to connect to consumers and share the whole story because so many people are so far from removed from agriculture um, that it's a great way to tie that in and then also link it to our wool products. Uh, so yeah, that's been that's been really, really fun. Always great connections, not just with other farmers, but but consumers as well. So yeah, then the last few years started expanding. Um, on the right there, you can see we sent out a big batch um, EI to get spun into blankets. I found a mill to do a large quantity of yarn for us. I found a mill for our batting, and our felt. So that's been really exciting to have these larger mills um, work with us. And because we've got so many sheep, we can do these larger quantities and expand the business in terms of like a uh, economies of scale so i've been able to work with dyers so sweet paprika was one of the first uh, dyers we worked with debbie and elizabeth at sweet paprika used three of our yarns as their base that they dye and that's been a, a really amazing thing um to to get into the knitting world a bit more that way because so there's all these you know dyers and patterns and it's a lot more than just making some yarn there's a lot behind that so that's been really great um, and it's really exciting that we can offer those kinds of um, larger quantities of yarns to dyers, because I think that's one of the important steps um, as the Canadian industry that we need to do um, to help replace some of the imported yarns and fibers that, that dyers are using. Yeah, next. And yeah, one of those big development things was starting to do some bigger markets. And because I was able to do batting blankets I decided to focus on some different markets as well so I've been doing the one of a kind show and some more artisan markets especially um, in the in Toronto and the, and that sort of helps us reach a whole different market I went on the fact that you know there's a lot of people that knit and want yarn and all of that good stuff but everyone needs a pillow everyone needs a blanket everyone should have a wool duvet so that betting side of the business has been um really amazing and important at, at growing uh, what we've got here. So there's just some, some pictures of that. Our yarn actually, I also do natural dyeing for all of the yarns. So that helps me use the creative side of my brain. I love doing the stuff in the barn and that's very like right side, but um, using my left side, you know, dyeing the yarn, website development, you know, even designing product tags, things like that helps me with uh, the creative side of my brain. Um, so that's worked really good. And yeah, now the wool business actually takes up more time for me than actual farming. Mm -hmm. So I kind of laugh. I'm a bit of a, a part-time farmer now because I just show up when the days are really busy or we're lambing in the barn. The rest mm -hmm. of the time I'm working in the wool business, which I would have never seen myself here <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty exciting that uh, the business has grown that much. Next. And here I'll just highlight some of the newer products that we've got. So I were excited. I finally got in um, my new batch of duvets, which are 100% are wool milled processed in Canada with 100% uh, pure cotton fabric grown and milled in the US. So this is a 100% North American duvet. Super excited about these um, really nice quality love how they feel. Um, so I'm excited to start promoting. It was a bit of, um, some of these projects have been very much just jumping in and crossing your fingers. 
because it's hard to get samples done when our quantities are fairly small. So it's sort of, you know, that minimum quantity order. Um, it's not just a test, like it's my batch for that half year or that year. Um, so super excited about those two things. And slippers, we got some amazing slippers made by one of our processors. So they're using our wool as the white space in there and then sewing up those slippers for us. So super excited about those wool slippers too that are comfy. Next. Pillows, I'll just highlight these. These are one of our best sellers. And this is sort of the thing that's helped me drive the business to the next level and reach out to more customers. Um, I was able to find this processor to do the batting and then I just stuffed the pillows. And pillows are a super simple thing to explain to people. You kind of have to explain, explain um, why you should have a wool pillow. Most people, you know, it's easily recognizable. It's a pillow. Everyone loves a good pillow. Um, and yeah, we're just subbing in the wool for there. And that's that's been really amazing. And yeah, other than that, I'm just right now uh, working on getting a website up and running doing those kinds of behind the scenes business thing, which always take a lot of time. I'm working on different shipping options to help um, work with our costs that way because shipping uh, for a small business is always a really frustrating sort of bottleneck that helps you down a little bit um, as far as costs. And then yeah, just working on promotion of our new duvets and the slippers. And then for the fall, I'll be getting ready for the big, big shows again for the fall. And uh, next, yeah, that's just uh, all the craziness that goes on here. Add in the wool business on top of it. Um, but yeah, it's these guys and our sort of long-term commitment to being large commercial producers that has allowed us to build the wool business as well. And maybe one day the kids will be involved. Maybe we'll have a kid take over the farm. Maybe a kid can help me with marketing and sales. Who knows? Um, but yeah, we're really, really excited for what the future holds. That was it. Yeah. That's us, me and Ryan and the lamb. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll do questions. You can either put your hand up or you can just type it into the chat and Matthew and I will moderate um, and read them out. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting when I listened to your podcast and read your website was the soil to soil system. Um, you did touch on that, but do you mind? I think that's a great thing to explain to people um, and talk about if you could get explain that a little more, please. Yeah, so it's just the system or the reference to soils to soil is the fact that wool is 100% natural and biodegradable. So they grow the wool from the crops and the, that are grown from the soil that we eat. And then, you know, the wool gets processed, all of that good stuff. We can use the wool. And then when we're done using the wool, it composts and goes back into the soil. So there's this whole complete closed circle for wool products, meaning um, it's soil to soil. There's no waste. It all gets recycled back um, and reused again. Great. Thank you. Um, just going to a question in chat from Audra. Did you have any challenges with staple length getting well processed when shearing so frequently? No, it has actually helped us um, because we're shearing more than once a little bit shorter. I actually find that when there's more than 10 or 11 months worth of growth on a sheet, the ends of the wool kind of become tatty and there's more chance for like dirt to get built up in there. So it's actually helped us create a more cleaner and consistent product. And mostly for the the batting and the felt, I don't worry about staple length too much. If I am sending a batch uh, to be made into yarn, sure we use only the mature um, sheep and um, sometimes we'll, we'll shear the younger, like the replacements, the young ram lambs and the ewe lambs when they're a bit younger. So, that shorter stuff, I make sure I save that for batting of felt where it doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah, and with it, with them being um, down type breeds, the door sits, the meat breeds, that wool has been amazing for our bedding. There's a lot of structure and loftiness to it. So it really helps um, keep the loft and those and the bedding. And then, then the yarn too, um, it really likes to hold its shape. Um, I have a sweater that 
you know, it gets washed. If I wash it, it gets washed in the regular laundry and air dried and it holds that shape. So um, yeah, wool is great both ways. Thank you. Um, Judith has her hand up. Judith, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Yes, I'm a bit of a fangirl for uh, Circular <laughs> Farm. I've been to your, your open day in the summertime and what really struck me is just the humanity that's in the barn with those lambs. Like they're just, it's a beautiful space to be in. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to be at the Kortha um, Fiber Festival? Maybe I not. will not be. Ah, I will what? be. I will be at Woolstock in Paris, and I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. I'll see you there in the in, fall. In Erin, at Feast of Fiber, in okay. August. Yeah, yeah. And, and will you have your? It's the only one. I didn't go to the other one where you were. I picked the one to Feast, for Feast Kortha. of Fiber in, in Erin. It's a new one, Feast of Fiber. Oh, okay, I'll look it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you posted on Instagram. Your new way of scouring the um, the uh, uh, fleece. How's hmm. that going in the anaerobic? Because I haven't done it. Uh, so, and for those that are on the call, there's a way yeah. to do it that Romy's doing that stinky, but apparently it's supposed to be good. It's it's called what is it? Sweat, sweat washing. I'm not sure. You just put the wool in a barrel of water and close the top and leave it for a month. I haven't actually looked at it again. <laughs> so. I think the thought is that eventually all those, um, the dirt bits dissolve and they sink to the bottom of the barrel, leaving clean wool mm -hmm. at the top. So we just have to sink that out um, and then just do like a basic wash on it after that. But it is still in progress. So I should go look at that actually this afternoon and see what's happening. Yeah, I'd like to see a picture. And will you have your, your um, farm day again when the sunflowers are out? Not this year, unfortunately. Okay. I might have in the in the fall. I might have like an open farm day with a pumpkin patch. Though we're not doing sunflowers this year. Yeah, it didn't. You've been work really out with busy this fields. year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've been it's really been really busy so far. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's okay. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Um, thanks. And uh, I, I also I shop to find you because I buy that bag of extra stuffing for pillows. But what I do is I put that in a smaller pillow so I can travel with it. So I go nowhere without your pillow yes. or a form yeah. thereof. So anyways, thank you. Thank you for what you do because it's so hard yeah. to get access to non superwash yarn. It's everywhere at all the festivals and it's so hard and I'm just trying to get off of um, plastic. So mm -hmm. thank you for what you do every day. Yeah. Thanks for cheering us on. It's always so good to know that people are out there loving what we do because a lot of this hasn't, you know, in the Canadian wool industry, this stuff hasn't been done for decades. So it, you we're kind of jumping in blind with some of it. Yeah, you know, I know it's it's the right or the good thing to do, but you still have to <laughs> still have to do it, and it still has to work. And are there any more questions in chat or? Um... You can just put your hand up. Don't be shy. Uh, yes, Jane. Thanks, Alyssa. That's a great presentation, Romy, and I love the fact that you're showing us more about what it what is involved in producing sheep and kind of demystifying what an accelerated lambing process looks like. I think we tend to be either like everything is wonderful or everything is awful in farming. And what you're showing is that there's a, a nice blend in the middle and there needs to be more talk about all of the good that you do. And it's Judith who mentioned um, what a nice feeling it is in your barn. Um, I've not been in, in your barn specifically, but the type of farming that you're doing, generally when you walk in these barns, it is a lovely atmosphere and the sheep are really calm and at ease. So it's perhaps not what Netflix might be leading you to believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, with sharing with with sharing the stuff from the farm, um, we're essentially a large, we're a large farm, we're a corporation, like we're incorporated as a family farm. And I, I blame it on Disney. It's called the red barn syndrome. People have this idealistic vision of what a farm is. And so much of that is, you know, 
they have just these visions, but we also need more farmers to tell the story because um, it's not necessarily what happens. And then people only get, you know, the bad side of the story. So making sure we share that. And yeah, we might have, you know, a thousand sheep, but each one of those sheep gets looked after um, like I would if I had five sheep. So it's showing that reality. It is. And, and Canada has a lot of, of good examples like that. And that story needs to be told over and over and over again. And that's everyone's responsibility, including our own at, um, at Canadian Wool Council. Um, but my question for you is, what's next? What do you see? <laughs> what are the emerging trends that you see coming out in wool? Oh, gosh. Um, if I'm putting you on the spot, you could tell me to mind my own beeswax. I some days I wish someone would just like tell me to do A, B, and C. I'm a little bit in this spot where the, I think the business has so much potential to grow, but it's it's just my husband and I, I have someone hired to help me with a little bit of the social media stuff and some of that online stuff, but do I hire someone to help with marketing? Do I hire someone to make products? Um, how do I do that? Um, but I'm starting to work with some, you know, I have some connections with some retailers now doing wholesale things like how does that look um I was just on the phone this morning with a lovely lady who wool coats and figuring out how we can get wool made that she can use in her coats so I'm I think I've got a really interesting position where because we have so many sheep and I've used up all the wool from our sheep I'm working with other farmers now so building these connections and this pipeline to get more wool processed into some of these and then to get it into you know the fashion pipeline the yarn pipeline um because that's not happening um at a large scale so how how do we make that happen but then grow our retail business here so i throw me your ideas <laughs> sometimes i don't know what to do there's just so much potential and the dangerous thing with wool is i can make 700 different things out of it and then there's still more new ideas right it's sort of focusing on what we're going to do here. Um, the bedding, the duvets, the blankets. Um, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on those now, um, but I still have all these connections and these abilities to hopefully get wool processed um, and, you know, push it into the fashion pipeline um, and that kind of thing too. Thanks. And we have another question from Judith. Judith, go ahead. Sorry, I'm such a hog in the mic today. One thing that I forgot, I, I'm just getting over COVID, so I had brain fog. So, uh, Romy, yesterday um, I watched a podcast on Fruity Knitting, and they, in, they um, interviewed Laxton's in England, and Laxton has started with a QR code on their yarn for traceability. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I think that that's one of the next next things for those around sustainability and um, climate and things like that. So it says it says at the moment it, they know exactly what flock it comes from. I don't know if it goes to actually down to the actual uh, sheep who provided it, but um, is that something you've been looking at as well for traceability? I yes and no. I know there's a couple groups um, or one or two groups um, in Canada for sure working on you know maybe developing a Canadian wool logo. The tricky thing being in Canada is we don't have like a system in place, like who would certify it, who's going to, you know, does there need to be, you know, a board of directors and all of that to govern something if we're making it traceable with a logo and certified and all that stuff. Like that's a huge, huge undertaking. Um, I think to start, if we just let customers know that it's Canadian wool, sometimes I'm you know, having certification and stuff, to be honest, as a farmer, it's really frustrating because it's a lot of paperwork and I don't necessarily know if it's adding a huge amount of value because if our customers right. already know it's Canadian wool, why should I have to pay to certify it? Um, and then sometimes I find it gets into, you know, what are you all going to certify? Um, yeah. A lot of that stuff, a lot of that certification is a lot of fancy marketing just to make customers, you know, make consumers feel better. Um, yeah. you know, things like animal welfare, like, well, of course I look after my animals, right? Like, otherwise mm -hmm. they're not going to be healthy and producing, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's certifications for things like that. So yeah, I don't know. There's, there's definitely potential there. It's just how do you develop that? Um, and how would that look for farmers? 
Well, and you don't, what you don't need is additional costs in your chain, uh, your supply chain, right? For, yeah. well, as you say, may be the feel good, um, feel good and unnecessary stuff that needs to go into uh, what you do. So I think your story of uh, your animal welfare, how you manage um, and care for your animals is the bigger story for people who are really looking to uh, support the Canadian market and Canadian sustainability. Hmm. If, if I could just jump in on on standards, because uh, this is something that came up again and again uh, at the international meetings, and this is something that the global industry struggles with as well, because everyone's trying to come up with a universal standard, but it just, there isn't really one that works for the different scales of industry. So for example, I mean, we ran into this ourselves with, you know, our longtime partner, Whole Renfrew, um, in the beginning, you know, they had implemented this new purchasing policy where everything had to be RWS and we wanted to do like, which is responsible wool standard. Um, and there's no one in Canada that is RWS uh, and we wanted to do a Canadian wool project. And so we had to, there was a lot of education uh, in terms of, of, well, why do you want this standard and what are you trying to achieve from this buying policy? And then, and then answering all of those questions, but it can be a lot of work because it's very easy for someone, uh, for a buying agent, for a major corporation to just say, yep, yeah, we need a standard. Here's one. This is what we'll do. Um, but without really thinking through, well, what are you trying to achieve through this? Uh, and how does that affect your other efforts in terms of sourcing, for example, Canadian wool products. So anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there that this is something that uh, that it's it's not just us grappling with it, that uh, the whole world seems to be uh, trying to figure figure this one out. So Thank you. Um, just going back to the chat. Margaret says that she has one year duvets and she loves it. And she's excited that now there's a made in Canada option. Um, Andrea has a question. Thank you for all that you're doing. Is there a breed that you can recommend as a good starter for somebody wanting to get into wool? So just having a couple sheep to start? Um, <laughs> there is no right answer to that question. Um, any kind of wool is amazing wool. There's different applications for it. Um, if you are considering, you know, if you are going to be using some of those sheep for me, you want to make sure they're, you know, they're going to create a good product again that way as well. I like dorsets, um, but <laughs> I'm preferential to what works. Um, but for example, um, our sheep are mostly in the barns versus some other flocks, you know, they're outside and they have systems set up for that. So picking a sheep that comes from a system that is similar to what you're going to do is really important. Um, our sheep don't really know what to do on a pasture and pasture sheep would be very confused what to do in here. Um, so that's an important consideration, but any sheep, I don't think you can go wrong. Start somewhere. And then, like I said, it only starts with a and then you get a few more and a few more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jane has her hand up. Thanks, um, Alyssa. I can't help but come back to the subject on traceability. And something that, that I've noticed, Romy's a bit of an exception because she has such a large flock. So she already has a bit of bargaining power in the supply chain because she has such a volume of wool. But in Canada, this is where we tend to differ from the UK or New Zealand. We don't have the same flock sizes. I know the UK does have some similar sizes to us, but the ones that are able to offer uh, like single source traceability, which is kind of the dream, the, the ideal that people look for, our flock sizes in Canada, if we do traceability, we have to look at manufacturing pathways that are a lot smaller and a lot more expensive. So we have to look at the overall cost of traceability on the end product. And I would say consumers could ask themselves, am I willing to pay $600 for a hand knit high quality sweater because it, it comes exactly from farm ABC? Or am I willing to go with um, a sweater that costs 300 um, knowing that it came from Ontario? It came from an Ontario flock. So that volume difference is something we need to consider as well. It's not the education too, right? Um, 
and that whole idea that if something is certified or traceable or single source that it's somehow better but I think in the end a lot of a lot of consumers just like with local food if they know it's Canadian the world I think that's the big the big check mark if it's Canadian um, that's the biggest thing for consumers. Well, and with RWS, Matthew mentioned RWS, but I think there's a misconception too, is RWS doesn't just protect the sheep. It means that the whole supply chain has to be RWS certified. That means a truck taking the wool from one processor to the next has to be RWS certified. Now in Canada, we don't have any trucking companies or intermediaries that work only with Canadian wool. We just don't have that size of of a market. So the reality of RWS working for us, getting all of our supply chain people to be RWS compliant and annually audited is going to be virtually impossible. Now, is there another certification process out there? Perhaps, but RWS is the one that has the most power today and it just doesn't fit the Canadian model or the smaller, the smaller market size um, country. Those are my two cents on it. Yeah, you really uh, see when, again, at the international meeting where I've, I've never met so many Australians in my life, including going to Australia, um, but the scale of their operations is just mind boggling. Like they had one of the one of the young professionals uh, who was with Ellen, who, Ellen Edney, who is, uh, for those of you who know Mariposa Mill, she came along as one of our, as, as our young professional uh, as part of that meeting. But standing beside her was a girl from Tasmania who on the family farm, they have 9,000 Merino. <laughs> so again, just like the orders of magnitude when you're dealing with like Aus the Australian wool industry is just head and above like anything that, Canada even approaches. So you're absolutely right, Jane. I mean, it, these solutions are important because they're addressing a need that is coming from com companies and buyers, but we have to figure out a solution that's going to work for Canada and not for 9,000 flock <laughs> merinos. Yeah. So, and one of the things I'm trying to do in working with other farmers is devel developing a bit of a standard, right? Like I need, you know, your sheep need to be fed a certain way to ensure there's less vegetable matter in the in the fleet you need to be skirting at shearing you need to you know take out bellies at shearing um you know things like that and then hopefully we might not have nine thousand sheep on one farm but there's enough of us farmers here in ontario that we could have that nine thousand sheep's worth of wool in a fairly consistent quality um most of us with larger flocks in ontario have very similar breeds. The wool is going to be very similar. So we get some of that together. Um, that'll be a start. And we're going to, we're going to show those Merino farmers. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, last call for questions. You can throw them in the chat or you can put your hand up. Uh, just a quick question, Romy, on on uh, on vegetable matter. Uh, what do you do? You know what your percentage is? I'm just uh, I'm curious because I know that's something that we uh, we I deal with. No, I have no idea. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> um, I, I don't know one percent. I don't know what that kind of like. You can like in our batting for the pillows and the duvets. Like you could see little like bits here and there. Like it's not noticeable but when it's felted you can see little flecks like it's a little more consistent but once it's spun as yarn or put into blankets it all comes out right um very low but i think even very low is too much compared to the stuff coming out of australia rangeland production that kind of thing because there they have zero right like and even if there is some they're doing some of that um what do they do to them? It like incinerates the, the uh, carbonizing, right? They're carbonizing it. So even if there is a, a wee little smidge, it's getting taken out. And yeah, some of some of the education part of it is too, like it's minimally processed. They're only using biodegradable soaps. They're not using harsh chemicals or carbonizing. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of vegetable matter in it. So changing minds, yes. educating, it's all about educating. 3.8% is the average in Canada. Okay. Yeah. So the goal is to get it down to 2%. 
yeah, then we start to come then we start to come closer to what our supply chain would love to see right yeah because that's certainly yeah with the larger scale processing they start to turn their nose up at, at stuff that once you once you're above uh, more than two percent it just creates more problems for them so they yeah <laughs> all these are all things that we've discovered in the last year as well <laughs> Any yeah. Other questions for Romy? Sorry, I cut you off there, Alyssa. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna get it wrapped up. Um, yeah, and you yeah. can follow Romy, um, Circle R Lamb and Revolution Volko on both um Facebook and on Instagram. Thank you so much, Romy, for talking to us. Um, very interesting perspective. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Welcome. Um, very interesting perspective of going through the wool value chain because you have your hands in more than one part of it um and i will throw it to matthew to wrap it up thank you Alyssa, and yeah thank you romy for for a great presentation and for especially i think it's a special treat to be able to watch your watch your sheep the whole time that you're you're speaking to us it's, so, it's such a beautiful operation that you have and uh, we're really excited to see what comes next in the revolution um you know, well, as a royal pa with a royal patronage, we're we're slightly uh, suspicious of revolutions, but yours is one we can get on board with. Um, but uh, but thank you again for 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 taking the time. And I believe um, we know the topic of our next spinning yarn speaker series as a preview, Alyssa. Yeah. So um, next month will be the town hall for the upholstery plan. And. Okay. We don't have a day yet, so just follow us on Instagram or on Facebook, and we will announce it. And speaking to that upholstery plan will be the one and only Jane Underhill, who wrote it. <laughs> um, so who will be talking about, again, in further to the, the series of reports that we've been preparing about high-value-added applications for Canadian wool. Uh, we've done one on carpets, so now we're looking at high-end upholstery. So hope that you can all join us for that. But with that, again, thank you everyone for, for joining our Spinning Yarn Speaker Series. Stay in touch, keep buying wool, and uh, we, we hope to see you at the next event. Thank you all and have a great day. <laughs>